special presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Robin Robinson. Thank you for joining us for another Backstage at Ordway Center presentation. Tonight, let's consider the concept of identity, the characteristics that make us who we are and recognizable to each other. Most often we want to be very clear and direct about who we are. Other times it works to our advantage to hide our true identity. This new millennium brought a new name to Ordway Center, from Ordway Music Theater to Ordway Center for the Performing Arts. That's no secret. But tonight, our show is not only about celebrating new names, it's also about a hit Broadway show coming to Ordway Center this week that is all about secret identities. We're glad you're with us as UPN 9 takes you backstage at Ordway Center with the Scarlet Pimpernel. Backstage at Ordway Center for the Performing Arts, The Scarlet Pimpernel is brought to you by your local Jeep dealer. Jeep, the most award-winning brand of 4x4s. Subway, the way a sandwich should be. And your local Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Chrysler engineered to be great cars. Welcome back to Backstage at Ordway Center with The Scarlet Pimpernel. This is a musical that has it all. Romance, mystery, intrigue, suspense, and of course, what every good love story needs, a revolution. This story is also about heroes and trying to figure out who the heroes are around us. Sometimes they're the people you would least expect. And that's where our story begins. The French Revolution. Starting just shortly after the American Revolution in 1776, it was inspired by the ideals of freedom from tyranny and rights of individual citizens, no matter what class you were in. But that's where the similarities end. The French Revolution, led by those who were driven to weed out all enemies of the state, were, let's say, very much into their work. By 1794, things began to spin out of control. Chaos reigned. People were starving. The government seemed powerless. And saying the wrong word to the wrong person about anything could very easily cost you your head. In September of 1792, nearly 1,400 French citizens were executed for treason, many of whom were declared guilty after only a few minutes of questioning. The streets of Paris flowed with blood as this crusade to purge these so-called enemies of the state wore on. As the French Revolution reached its peak in 1793, the year King Louis was beheaded, it became clear that perhaps the worst enemy of the state was the guillotine. The horrors of the French Revolution reached the shores of England where our hero, Sir Percival Blakeney, or Percy, and his well-to-do friends decide that they must take action to save some of these unfortunate souls who are awaiting execution. One of those executed was a friend of Percy's, and one can imagine his devastation when he learns that it was actually his French fiancée, Marguerite, who has provided the authorities information that lead to his capture and execution. Now that's a reason to have some real wedding night jitters. Amy Bardner plays Marguerite. Well, the trust and the betrayal of the story is really the, the crux of the story. Percy and Marguerite get married at the top of the show after only having known each other for six weeks. So uh, the trust is established, but on a very short period of time. So when he finds out about the betrayal in the wedding, that really uh, is even more of a, a plot point than it would be in other stories because they haven't known each other that long. So the trust really isn't so established. That's why it's so important to, to the Pimpernel. Whether or not uh, Percy should even trust Marguerite because we don't really understand why she's going through all of this. Why has she done this? Um, and we find that out in the second act. And that's why the, the last song of the first act in, in the riddle is so important. Can you trust me? Can I trust you? We don't know. We don't know who can trust you. 
So the mild-mannered Percy decides to become the Scarlet, Scarlet Pimpernel, someone who will bravely risk his life for others, but must appear to be almost a buffoon at times to throw off any suspicion of his real identity. Douglas Sills, who originated the role on Broadway, talks about this mix of drama and comedy and how extreme circumstances can change people. That this character has virtually given up his life, I think, in my interpretation, after he finds out that he's put all his eggs in this basket of marrying this woman, and on the day of his wedding, that he thinks his life is changing for the better, he finds out that this woman is not who he thought she was, and he decides to dedicate his life to something greater than his own. Um, and that's one of those moments where I think people are confronted with elements of their personality that they didn't know existed. And speaking of personality, Douglas needed to produce two for this role, one of the foppish Percy and one of the daring, courageous Scarlet Pimpernel. How exactly do you play a guy playing another guy? Well, it's changed over time as my goals changed. Um, when I began, it was easiest for me to define them very distinctly with different vocal timbre, with different pronunciation, with different dialect, specifically with different physicalization different body construct. That is to say, one would lead with its chest, one would walk with its hips forward, whatever it was, so that I could easily make a shift. As time progressed, I felt the greater challenge was to dovetail those things more gently so that they could be seen by the audience as more elements of a larger piece elements that he may not have ever known he had or been aware of. So that's more interesting to me. So Percy and Marguerite's marriage is off to a bit of a rough start. As if things weren't bad enough, enter Chauvelin. It's not known at the beginning of the show, but we soon learn that Marguerite and Chauvelin have a past. Well, Marguerite and Chauvelin, as we discover in the second act, have met uh, the day that they stormed the Bastille. So uh, it was a very uh, fun-loving time. It was a very um, exciting time. And there was, and she was an actress. She was a great actress of La Comédie Française. So she has this great passion for life. And that's something that she and Chauvelin shared the day they stormed the Bastille. So they, they kind of probably got carried away with that. And also Chauvelin is this dashing figure. He's, um, he's powerful. And, you know, when you see him in the show, he's, he's great looking, he's, he's very, he can be very charming. And they get carried away with each other. She gets swept probably off her feet by him. And at the time that she meets him, he's not this terrible evil man. I think that Chauvelin's character develops into being more evil as time goes on. And probably a lot of his evil comes out of the passion that he has for Marguerite. And, and the fact that he is jealous of her relationship with Percy and the love that she feels for Percy that she never felt for Chauvelin. So that, that stirs him to, to be uh, more evil. William Paul Michaels, who plays Chauvelin, tells us why it's good to be bad. It's, uh, it's the best, I'd say. It's an easy role to play. Uh, you get to be smarmy and, and evil and raise an eyebrow and even seductive in this case, and it's, uh, it's the best role. I think it's, it's the easiest role in this show. Uh, Doug here has got the hard role. He's got to be the comedian and the hero. Uh, I'm getting so used to being the bad guy now. Uh, even when I play good guys, I play bad guys. The last role I played was the Beast, and uh, he starts out as a bad guy and turns into a good guy. So uh, I'd say it's the best role in the show. So it's good to be the bad guy. And Chauvelin is easy to hate. But should we feel any sympathy for this headhunter? Oh, of course. If you, don't feel, if you don't feel sympathy for the bad guy, then he's just a cardboard cutout. And, uh, and he doesn't really affect the audience. But Chauvelin, like any, like any character in any play, has feelings. He's a, he's a human uh, with many dimensions and a lot, of, a lot of business going on in his head. In this case, he is truly in love with Marguerite, but he's kind of a dif dysfunctional guy who can't really show that without, oh, without being violent or... Uh... Well, the director and I came upon the term of base, 
and it's the baseness of Chauvelin that is the, the source of his attractiveness and it's the source of his evil. Uh, he, he can't really decipher from ethical and fanatical. So what we have here is a good old-fashioned love triangle, but the choices made here can mean the difference between life and death. Chauvelin has given Marguerite an ultimatum, help him capture the Scarlet Pimpernel, or her brother will die in the guillotine. We all have to make tough choices and tough decisions, and Marguerite's decisions are very difficult because she has to decide basically between saving her brother and, you know, and betraying her husband and betraying everything that her husband knows. So how do you, how do you decide that? It seems that maybe Marguerite had fallen for the wrong guy when she met Chauvelin. Did Amy draw on any personal experiences in this area? Uh, sure, absolutely. You know, we all make mistakes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, although I, I guess Marguerite doesn't know, of course, as, as we all don't know when we fall for the wrong person, that she's made a mistake at that time. Drawing upon life experiences can help an actor portray a role. But Douglas Sills did not necessarily have a great deal of personal knowledge about what it was like to be an English nobleman in the late 1700s. So how did he develop the role of Percy? Well, I did do a lot of research, but that's my thing. I think everybody has their own psychological approach to acting. And something that I like to do is get a lot of definitive uh, empirical information, because it grounds me. So. I did do a lot of research. I watched every movie that has been shot in that period from Barry Lyndon to Danton to Tale of Two Cities, all the different incarnations, Cyrano, which is close um, in style. It has its own sense of style. I went to the museum, uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where they have a lot of interiors from the period, both from England and France from that period, which are really instructive. You see things like how the room is lit only by candlelight and how that changes, how the furniture is made, and it forces you to sit at the edge of the furniture, comme ça, you know what I mean? And that's, that's wonderful. Um, the colors that they would use, the wood tones, the way the rooms are laid out, the sense of echo, how you whisper and it's heard across a room wonderful things like that and paintings paintings which are really the only kind of research really hard factual knowledge we have about the aristocracy in a lot of ways in visual terms obviously and that gives you a sense of how they carried themselves how they wanted to be thought of uh, and that was really instructive and we continue to use those images to this day I keep them around me all the time as you can imagine, researching a production like the Scarlet Pimpernel is a trip down some of the most stylish and opulent images in European history. I don't know what show could ever have such incredibly beautiful costumes. I've, I've never been in a show that has such elaborate, beautiful costumes. And I've been in some, some really beautifully clothed shows, but this particular show, one of the best drawing points of this show is to, to come and to, when you stand there in those clothes at the top of the ball in the second act, when you see all these women in these gorgeous, gorgeous ball gowns from, from the 18th century that are so perfectly done to the letter, you just, it's breathtaking. The women in the Scarlet Pimpernel certainly are beautiful, but male chauvinism reaches new heights or lows during one of the show's lighter musical numbers where Percy and his friends divert attention from themselves as possibly being the Scarlet Pimpernel by reinforcing their appearance as foppish Englishmen who are only concerned with fashion. A catchy little number called The Creation of Man. One has to strike a pose and bear the weight of well-tailored clothes. And that is why the Lord created man. Amy tells us that dressing every day like Marguerite may be a challenge. But she would do it with a little help. Well, I would have had to have had my wonderful dresser, Susie, to put her foot in my back. That's how I would have done it. The costumes will transform audiences to another time. But the music and lyrics to the show will send them out of the theater humming. When we come back, we'll meet the author and composer. And there's a Minnesota connection. So stay with us as Backstage at Ordway Center continues. Never hold back a 
Subway has seven fresh value meals with just eight grams of fat or less, while a Big Mac extra value meal has 58. Subway, the way a sandwich should be. Chew, chew, chew. Right now, when you choose from the lowest priced minivan to the ultimate, you can get $1,500 cash allowance or 0.9 financing for 60 months, which means you can save over 4,700 in finance savings on a new Chrysler Town & Country and the popular Voyager. Now get 1500 cash allowance or 0.9 financing for 60 months on all new minivans at your Chrysler and Plymouth dealer today. Save on pizzas in Richfield, cars in St. Paul, bagels in Golden Valley, steaks in Brooklyn Park. The big coupon site is coming to KMSP.com. You work too hard to pay too much. Save on exactly what you want, when you want it. Thousands of coupons, 24 hours a day. Find the values in your neighborhood with one click of your mouse. No, not that mouse. TheBigCouponSite.com. Because life's expensive. Put your offers on the big coupon site. Call 707-1212 before your competitor does. Welcome back to Backstage at Ordway Center. The story of the Scarlet Pimpernel was written almost 100 years ago, but it took the talented writer and lyricist Nan Knighton to transform the story into a compelling, intriguing, and fun experience for the stage. When you add to that the musical compositions of Frank Wildhorn, who in 1999 became the first American composer in 22 years to have three shows running simultaneously on Broadway, Scarlet Pimpernel, The Civil War, and Jekyll and Hyde, you can see how this winning collaboration created a hit. Both Nan and Frank were on hand in New Haven, Connecticut, where the Scarlet Pimpernel opened its nationwide tour, one stop before coming to St. Paul. We talked with them about how the show came together and about how musical theater is staying together. First things first, just what are the challenges in bringing a production like the Scarlet Pimpernel to the stage? Was what was most challenging was keeping him alive. Um, uh, oh, it's been one series of challenges after another. The, the initial challenge was to write the book because um, for so long we couldn't, uh, nobody seemed to be able to write uh, the book for this. I, I, I think the problem was that everyone kept saying, I haven't found the right concept yet for the Scarlet Pimpernel. And to me, the story itself was so great that you didn't need to come at it from some, you know, some wild artistic conceptual angle. It was, it was there, it was just tell the story. Um, but, um, I, you know, I laugh, but it's true. I think the greatest challenge for me as a writer has been how, to, how do I keep this show going? Because I love the show and I believe in it, and people, people really do seem to love it and be happy after they see it. And um, I, I suppose there are some writers who feel that their job is done once they finished writing it, but I've, I've felt very much that my job is to make sure this show keeps going and stays alive. We've seen other Broadway shows that are modern day adaptations of classical works, such as Rent, which was based on Puccini's opera La Boheme. Would it be possible to place the Scarlet Pimpernel in a modern world? Ultimately, I felt, and we all felt, that it belonged best in its own period. Uh, the, the particular kind of wit and humor that is Percy's seems to belong so much in that period and um, and I you know I loved basing the show on the book as it was I mean the book is is very rich and has wonderful things in it and uh, I it just felt like yeah that guy belonged in that period Frank Wildhorn has had as much success off Broadway as on he wrote Whitney Houston's number one hit from 1988 where do broken hearts go we asked Frank about the difference between writing music for Broadway versus the pop charts. The craft is the same. You're still trying to write melodies that people, you know, that are accessible and that people can understand and hopefully even hum. Um, 
I think when you're writing for a pop artist and you're writing for the radio, you're much more writing within a box, a three and a half minute box. And then you got to get out of there. And let's get to the hook in 45 seconds. And let's repeat the second chorus by a minute 40. And there really is that kind of formula when you're writing, you know, for, for a pop kind of thing. Uh, for the theater, as a composer, you know, the music has so much more responsibility. It's whether it's giving insights into the emotions or points of view of a character. Sometimes it's actually helping move the story along. So, you know, you use a different craft and a different facility. But uh, hopefully the inspiration is the same. And uh, I think those are the similarities. This is a very interesting time in the musical theater. Uh, you know, you've mentioned musical theater, and you've also mentioned Broadway. And to me, they're not always the same thing. You know, Broadway is a few streets between a couple of rivers in New York. And I don't write for that. When I, when I sit down and I write, I write for theater, or I write for the public. And that's a national and international world. And, you know, something like the Civil War, which, you know, honestly didn't work on Broadway but is working fantastic around the country, both from a business and a review point of view. And, uh, you know, we'll be running now for years around the country. So I think it's just important to write from your heart the best you can. Broadway's important, don't get me wrong. The credibility of Broadway, having that as a flagship for your copyright is very important, and you always want to play in Yankee Stadium. If you play ball, you want to play with the best play. But I think at the same time, you got to realize that theater is a national and an international, you know, world out there. And from a national and international world, what about the explosion of media available on the World Wide Web? Does he see that as a threat to his industry? Any time that you can make the net bigger, uh, get to more people, that has to be a good thing. Um, when you're in a theater, don't forget you can only get in a typical New York theater 1,200 people a night. Uh, someone once told me that in the course of a year of a successful sitcom on TV, more people over that year, we'll watch that sitcom that have seen theater in the history of the world. How's that? And in a world that we live in where NASCAR racing and worldwide wrestling have millions and millions and millions of, of, of patrons and customers, any way that we can find, any means that we can find to get the music and to get theater to more people has got to be a good thing. While on tour with the Scarlet well, Pimpernel in stage. New Haven, Frank, <laughs> Nan, and Douglas Sills visited nearby Yale University and talked to drama students who were eager to hear about the beginnings of the Scarlet Pimpernel. What they heard was some inside scoop, some fun anecdotes, and a little advice. And I kind of do what I usually do, which is fly by the seat of my pants. <laughs> so the night before, I saw the miniseries, and I conjured a bunch of melodies that actually t uh, looking back today half a dozen of those melodies became songs that are in the show writing for me is a very visceral non-intellectual exercise so i just kind of feel it and people came and they loved it and we were really thrilled i mean you don't know until that moment whether you really have something or not until you you have your first audience and it was maybe it was fewer people than are in this room right now little tiny basement theater and they laughed and they cried and they and we were um, I think that was one of the most exciting days ever for me was that one day when you finally know that you, ha you have a show. Um, we started auditioning and we were finding great people for the, the chorus and the ensemble and so forth, but we were lacking the one essential element, which was the Scarlet Pimpernel. And this was this role that I had written, because I had departed a, a, a fair amount from the novel, and the novel uh, it's pretty much told from Marguerite's point of view, and it's a rather static story. You, you're never really in on any of the adventures where the Pimpernel saves anyone. And although it's witty, it's never really funny, and it's always like on the brink of that. So I had written this to be much more adventurous, and I had written it from the Scarlet Pimpernel's point of view, made him dead center, and, and made him very funny. So what we were looking for was someone who could be a hero and a leader and uh, romantic and very funny, and who could sing Frank's music, which is almost impossible. And one by one by one, we were sent everyone who does all the lead roles on Broadway, and no one could do it. Either they sang well and they were a hero, but they weren't funny, or they were funny, but they were ugly, or they were this or the <laughs> 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 and, and then came Doug's audition and how he wait, auditioned. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> No, but I want to tell from my point of view and then let him take that over. Okay, okay so, so we, we, we finally went out to Los Angeles because uh, we couldn't find anybody in New York. We had even flown in people from Australia, London. We couldn't find anybody. So we went out to Los Angeles and we're sitting in this little studio 
watching people come in and out. And in walks this guy in a blue shirt. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's just, that's the most handsome man I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and then I thought, because he's so handsome, he won't be able to do a damn thing, you know. And, um, and he came forward and he sang. And we were all like, oh my God, he really sings pretty well, you know. And, and then he read some of the serious scenes, and then we were like, he can act. And then he read the funny scenes, which was the acid test, and we were hysterical. And that man was Douglas Bill. Part of the sequence of my career is that I, I often get called in for the lead, but I don't have the marquee name or the ticket value name, so I don't get the lead. So I'll get down to the last two guys, and then the other guy gets it, whether it's a guy who has a TV show or has a new album or whatever it is. So I had a new strategy that had worked for me quite well, that you, you, you see that coming and you audition for the other part. So when I came in, I knew they'd want to see me for the Pimpernel, but I was going to be prepared with the villain stuff. I walk in, and the first thing I say is, why don't you sing first? So I sing, and, uh, and I said, uh, I'm going to sing. He said, what are you going to sing for us? And I said, someone like you. And Frank kind of went like this. <laughs> Is there, I said, is there a problem? Should I? He goes, no, I just never heard a guy sing it before. <laughs> and I just went, oh, my God. No, no, my God. I so screwed this up. Uh, by then, it's too late. You know, I don't really have a choice. It's very difficult because there was drama, and there was love, and there was comedy. And there were probably four scenes or five scenes of each. And don't let anyone kid you, a per an audition is a performance. It's not, you don't just go in and say, well, I'll read it. And I mean, it's a performance. It's a different kind of performance, but it's a performance. So after soaking up some of the local color there in New Haven on the campus of Yale University, Frank Wildhorn reminded us of another bit of local color that he's gleaned from the next stop on the tour, Minnesota. I have, I have a, a funny and a personal history with Minnesota, besides being the coldest place on earth. And the coldest days of my life have been spent at Linda's Christmas concerts you know, at the Ordway or Orchestra Hall or et cetera. Uh, Linda is from a, a horse farm in Anoka, Minnesota. Her parents still live up in Brainerd uh, by Lake Mille Lacs up there. Uh, I spend a lot of time there. It's a great, wonderful decompression chamber for my life, Minnesota. The air, the water, just being there, the, the quiet, the solitude when we're on the lake. Uh, I've done writing there. I've actually written a lot of my shows, pieces of my shows in Minnesota on Linda's farm. And uh, obviously, you know, my wife, Linda, you know, grew up there and is a kind of favorite daughter there, and we go back and do concerts all the time. Kevin McCallum, who runs the Ordway Theater, is a kind of a, a friend and a supporter of, of, of Linda and my own work over the years. So it's kind of a homecoming when, you know, one of my shows can go back there, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. The Linda to whom Frank is referring is actually his wife, Linda Etter, who called Minnesota home for most of her life. Linda has been busy with her own performing career, as well as her acclaimed role on Broadway as Lucy in Jekyll and Hyde. Whether Frank Wildhorn and Linda Etter are actually working together or not, the influence is always there. Linda, li Linda herself has never physically done the Scarlet Pimpernel on stage, but I've got to be honest, the part of Marguerite was really written for her voice. Uh, and actually, to take that a step further, uh, so far in my career, the female leads of the shows that I've done how could I do that without Linda's voice being in my head? You know, she, she lives, you know, we, we live together, and certainly musically, she's more than a muse. She's a real partner. She's got wonderful taste musically, and also to be able to write something and then hear her sing it right away, you know, gives me such an idea if I'm on the right track or not. So she really is a partner, and, and yeah, it was, it was written for her. Now here's a footnote, a rather tiny footnote. One of Frank and Linda's latest collaborations, their son, Jake, who was born in August of last year. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll be joining in on some very special events going on at Ordway Center. And no, we're not going to be talking about Romeo and Juliet. However, we will be considering the question, what's in a name? Even with its impressive power, remarkable handling, and legendary capability, 
Jeep Grand Cherokee can still be leased for just $3.59 a month. Maybe that's why everyone's going out of their way to get a look at it. The $3.59 a month Grand Cherokee lease. Check one out at your Jeep dealer. Who's on the cover of Minnesota Business?